Hello, this is Janet from JanetSandberg.com, and you're listening to the Phoenix Wisdom Podcast, the weekly show that talks to peers and professionals who open up about their darkest moments when they felt like ending it all, why they didn't, and how they transformed their lives in order to triumph over the darkness and despair. Please remember to subscribe if you'd like to hear more inspiring stories. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Phoenix Wisdom Podcast. I am your host, Janet Sandberg, and today we are talking to the lovely Tony LaShawn. Tony, welcome. Let's Thank get you started me. with you telling us a little bit about yourself. My name is Tony LaShawn Worderly. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm an educator, I'm an author, I am a singer songwriter and a worship leader. Um, I wear many, many hats, <laughs> um, and I am, through my music and through my ministry, just spreading the word about mental health and wellness, and specifically dealing with and how to battle anxiety. Beautiful. I love it. I'm very excited to figure, <laughs> to hear your whole story and how how you ended up here, how this is, this is a new... Um, perspective that we're having tying the music into the healing. So I'm very excited to, to hear your story. Um, so let's dive right in. Where, where were you? What was going on in your life when you thought that it wasn't worth living? Um, about three years ago in February, well, four years ago now, time is flying really fast. Um, <laughs> Four years ago now in February, um, just before the whole pandemic started, um, I was in my classroom and I got uh, the door opened by an administrator and they were like, we need you to come to the office. Um, I walked into the main office and my sister was there. So I knew that something was going on with my family because my sister was at my job. Right. Um, and so they ushered me into someone's office and my mom, she called my mom and my mom told me that my grandfather had passed away. Oh, um, he was 86 years old. So people are like, oh, he lived a long life. But what people don't understand is he was my last living grandparent. Um, and we had a special bond. It wasn't necessarily like that you could tell of our bond outwardly, but you know, he and I, we just, we just related to each other. So we were both like super introverted. We could literally just sit in a room together all day and communicate without even communicating. We just had a, we had a really special relationship. And um, at the time I was 42. Um, I've been divorced for what seems like forever now. It's actually been like half of my life that I've been divorced. Um, and so at the time, the first thing that kind of hit me as I was processing was I no longer have a chance for my grandparents to meet my children. Mm -hmm. Um, and that just took me into this whole spiral of every mistake that I had ever made in life in relationships, every choice that I had made that led me to at that time being 46 and single and childless. And um, in that time, I just started to feel like, what is my purpose even mm -hmm. on this earth? Like if I'm not leaving a legacy, if I'm not I don't have children to, you know, follow after me, to know me, my parents, my grandparents, like what, what am I even here for? Um, and so during that time and that grieving process, I'm so grateful for my sister. My sister's actually a mental health counselor. She could tell even okay. before I could that mm -hmm. something was seriously going wrong. 
Um, and she was like, I'm going to stay here with you. Um, even when she did leave, she checked on me constantly. So fast forward from that and from grieving my grandfather, then COVID hit. Yeah. Um, and during the holiday season, my entire family got COVID. Oh no. In uh, at that point, like I said, I think it was, what was I? It was 42. So at that point, I had only spent one holiday season away from my family. My family were like, we kind of joke that we don't have friends because we have each other. Um, we're, just, we're just that close. And there's a bunch of us with my mom, dad, my siblings, my nephews and my nieces. And um, just not being able to see them over the holidays, we tried to do like a Zoom together. Mm -hmm. And it was just, and that was probably the lowest point of my life I still hadn't completely um completed but like completely gone through a grieving process for my grandfather yeah um I still was dealing with the complexities of dealing with hybrid learning and COVID mm -hmm. and being a teacher with kids in school or on zoom and it was a lot of change going on which really amped up my anxiety um, I yeah. tried seeing a therapist and it wasn't very helpful. And there was just, there was just so much going on. So during, in that holiday season, I really, that's when I really was like, you know, what, I, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like feeling this alone. Right. Um, you know, it was, there were so many times when I was surrounded by a bunch of people, but I still felt like I was completely alone, like just mm -hmm. alone, even in a crowd. Um, and I did not overtly talk about ending my life to anyone. Um, but I know that I was kind of hinting. I was trying. It's like I was trying to get that help. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I didn't want to scare my family right um you want them to know without actually having exactly. to tell them I, I precisely <laughs> I wanted them to know like I am not in a good place I am not in a good place at all um without actually telling them and so we managed to get through that season again with my sister was like during that holiday season even though we couldn't be in the same house with each other because we were both sick mm -hmm. <laughs> we were like constantly on the phone with each other or like you know watching shows together just she was keeping me engaged yeah. I think and honestly we've never really spoken about it but I think she knew mm -hmm. um because of her background and her experience she knew that I just couldn't be like left to myself for very long in that period of time um and so that after that season that February I was like okay I've got I have to get out of this um there have been times in my life where before that where I've thought about I wanted everything to end um and music was a great great like savior for me mm -hmm. um literally saved my life when I was 18 and I was staring at a bottle of pills like ready to take them all and in that instance, though, I was like, I don't, I, I, I did not want to end my life. Right. I just wanted the noise to quiet down. And I just wanted to like sleep for a really long time, if that mm. makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, you know, that time was different than this time, because um, if I had taken those pills, I probably would have died or would have done some serious damage to my organs, and my brain, um, and I didn't because I started to hear like in my spirit, a song that I grew up with called He's That Kind of Friend by Tremaine Hawkins. It's a gospel song that I grew up with. I think it came out before I was even born, but I heard it all the time and it wasn't actually playing, mm -hmm. but I could hear it like as clear as day. And, it, and that kind of jolted me out of that situation when I was 18. Um, this situation when I was 42 was, was a little bit different. Yeah. Um, because I did just want to like go to sleep and not wake up. 
Yeah. Um, and so in that February, I was reading a book on songwriting. I was like, I got to snap myself back out of this. Like when my grandmother passed away, focusing on music really helped me to grieve and to deal with that. Um, so I was reading a book and I started doing a songwriting exercise out of the book and ended up writing a song called Strength to Soar. And that song and that writing process really started my grieving process. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually finally really let myself grieve. Now, mind you, this is like a year after my grandfather passed away. So I finally started to let myself live life again, mm -hmm. um, be happy again, um, find joy in things again. And then that September, I went to Nashville to record the song with one of my friends. And while I was in Nashville, unbeknownst to me, um, a woman who was basically like my surrogate grandmother since my grandmother had passed away, she passed while I was there. She actually passed away on the day that I recorded that song. Mm -hmm. um, I had spoken to her just before I left to go to Nashville. Um, and she was just really upset because she was in a nursing home and because of COVID, we couldn't go see her anymore. Yeah. And there was just so much going on. And when I got back, um, my mom told me that she had passed away. So it was like, I got to this great place and then all of a sudden I just plummeted back down and mm -hmm. that brought in a whole other set of feelings because again she was almost 96 when she passed away okay. she lived a very long life but she was um you know she her spouse had passed away long before so she had been widowed for a very long time she never had any children of her own and she was depending on her nieces and nephews to take care of her as she got older and again that just sent me into like my anxiety just grabbed a hold of that and was like mm -hmm. that's going to be you you're going to be old and you're going to be a burden to oh, your nieces no. and nephews no. and they're going to put you in a home and they're going to and and my mind just started like spiraling out of control with that and it just kind of set me back again um but the music has always kind of brought me out of it so that song strength to soar I sang it for my church and that's when I decided to, that I was going to record it um and then by the following January I was like you know what I'm gonna actually release this song because there was something that happened every time I sang it that mm -hmm. just kind of took over my being and what that thing was, was I was really, um, being strengthened by God, like yeah, all the places where I was hurting, all the places where I was anxious, all the places where I was depressed, like, and just tired and just mm -hmm. tired, just tired. Yeah. <laughs> just tired. Um, God was strengthening me through that song. And, um, so that kind of propelled me out of that place. And I, with the music, I thought to myself, you know, there's probably other people with all that's going on. Mm -hmm. There's other people that are going through these things. They're suffering in silence. They don't think that anybody understands. And so one of the missions in my music is letting people know and understand like that there are other people out there who've had these experiences. We might not have the same exact situation, but we do understand what it feels like to feel like you're in a place where you just don't want to be here anymore. Um, mm -hmm. What it feels like to feel like your anxiety is taking over your life. Mm -hmm. My most popular song is called Don't You Worry, um, which I wrote 20 plus years ago, but mm -hmm. just recorded in 2022. Um, and I think a lot of people relate to that because I don't think there's a person on earth who doesn't experience some leveling of anxiety. Right. Yeah. For me, my anxiety is actually a diagnosis. <laughs> I have generalized anxiety disorder. Again, that's something that I found out half my life ago. Um, I am just now in the last probably six months getting to a place where I know how to navigate it without, um, 
with the help of a therapist, with my faith and without medicine for the first time in a long time. Um, and so, you know, I just want people to understand that like, don't look on the outside of what you see people um, out there. I try to be very, people know that know me know I am quite literally an open book. Like I have mm -hmm. written books and I've very plainly and rawly say <laughs> what, I am, what I have gone through and what I have been through, maybe even to a fault. I'm an open book. Um, a lot of times, you know, people are looking for that. I know I was searching for that transparency and vulnerability in people and anyone I could relate to that I felt I could relate to what I was going through. So that's what I try to do through my music, through my writing is just reach out to people. That's why I do interviews. I'm like, you are, you are not alone. And there are ways to handle the mental health issues that you're dealing with, um, the crises that may come up in, in your life. Exactly. Exactly. So we're, we're basically doing the same thing, but through different mediums, you know, I have the podcast for that exact reason, like you said, you know, just to let people know that they're not alone, that we, so many of us go through and, and we're all human. We all have the same thoughts and feelings. And, um, even though it feels like we're the only person on the planet who's ever felt this way or ever been through this or ever dealt with this. Like you said, you know, the the situation might be a little bit different, but the feelings and the emotions that come with that, you know, they're all the same. We all have the same ones. Um, and sometimes it's really hard for us to deal with them. Um, and having that outlet to heal is, is what we need, um, whether it's writing or right. songwriting or even just listening to music can, can be very healing. Like you said, your song, mm -hmm. um, would you say, don't you worry? Like just listening to other mm -hmm. people say the words is, is just as good. And then, you know, I'm sure if you sing along with it, um, it helps twice as much. And I made sure that it's upbeat. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's upbeat. I like an upbeat. There's a there's a jazzy version, and then there's Ooh. actually like a dance remix to it. That like if you're having that moment, and you just need to. One of my favorite things to do when I'm like in a moment is to put on some music and just like dance around my house, like yes. just nothing choreographed, nothing that I would ever want anyone to see. But I just like let my body move, and yeah. so. When I recorded the original one, I like which I love because I loved um, just the like the jazzy bluesy vibe of it. Mm -hmm. But I was like, you know, I want people to have a version of this where they can dance it out, they like can they crank can it up, like <laughs> crank it up in the car, in their house, in their kitchen, like wherever they are, in their bedroom, and just like jump on the bed or dance around or whirl their body around to it, and just like really take it in, like. You don't need to give in to the anxiety that you are feeling. Um, it is anxiety. I've learned specifically, and like I said, in the last like six months, like anxiety is such a liar. <laughs> it just, is. It's such a liar. And it took me so long to actually sit and notice what my anxiety was saying to me and how ridiculous it is. Like, I'm mm -hmm. like... These things are never going to happen. Why do I think that they're going to happen? Like nothing that my anxiety has told me is going to happen has actually come to fruition. Have I had bad things happen in my life? Yes, I have. I have had tragedies. I've had catastrophes happen in my life. My anxiety was not right about it <laughs> or how they would play out. <laughs> yeah, that tends to be the case. No matter how many crazy things that we think of in our anxious moments, something else might happen. But generally speaking, not any of the things that our brain has come up with. It is not as um, bad as what my brain, I'm like, I, the, the brain is so beautiful because I'm like, you know, I appreciate the fact that I'm a creative and imaginative person. Yes. It really helps in a lot of the facets of my life. <laughs> Yes, it's a wonderful imagination. Spiral, 
yeah. so I just have to go back to like what is reality what is real what is it realistically uh, likely to happen and just really listen in and hone in on that and instead of and like kind of catch myself in that moment and say okay now all right now that I know all the worst things that could happen, what's the best way this could turn out? Like what, what yeah. are the good things that could possibly happen, happen from this situation? Exactly. Um, you know, what is, what's, what's the best way it can turn out instead of the wrong way. I did not have the tools to kind of stop my spiral mm-hmm. um, for a lot of my life. Um, And so that's one of the things that I'm so grateful for is being able to kind of get grounded and see the truth that is around me and not the, the so-called truth that my anxiety is trying to project on me. Mm -hmm. Well, and even like you said, like one of those tools is, is moving your body, like Mm -hmm put on music and dance it out. And it feels great. But the reason it feels great is because we're working those emotions out of our body. If we just sit on the couch and wait for them to go away, it takes so much longer than if we move or go to the gym or dance around your living room or take a walk, like whatever, but moving our body to help move those emotions through and out is, is really, really helpful. So I, I love that, that you've, that you realize that you do that for yourself, but also that you've created a song for other people to be able to do that. Yeah. Because it's, it's so important. It is you, you said something there about just like sitting there waiting for it to go away. When I went to meet with my uh, most recent therapist in the first meeting, I was like, listen, like I'm anxious. I'm, I have insomnia. I have like all these issues. And I really just, and he was like, what do you want to get out of this? And I was like, I want them to go away. (laughs) I I would like for you to give me the tools to get rid of them. And long story short, he basically said, I can't do that. No, I'm not going to be able to rid you of that part of yourself. Um, But what we were able to do is we did the work over weeks and months where we were able to identify what was going on that was triggering it right and able to take the time to notice what was causing me to be anxious what was causing me to not sleep and then from there to notice what helped Mm -hmm. get out of that spot and what helped because a lot of times, like you had just said, I was just like, I just need to be in a room and I crank my TV up and I have noise and I just want to sit on the couch and I just want to veg and like hope that it goes away or hope that I can just drown it out and just not even deal with it. It wasn't until I started actually listening to like, what is my brain telling? I was, I was scared of mm-hmm. the things. I mean, I, again, like I've been dealing with this for my whole life. Um, with feeling like I had this like doom and gloom voice in my head. (laughs) And so I got to a point where I was just like, nope, when you start, I'm drowning you out. I'm tuning you out. I'm not listening to you. But that was a mistake. I needed to listen because I needed to hear the lies that were being told to me. I needed to listen so that I could confront the things that my brain was saying with what I knew to be true. Mm -hmm. And then when I did that, then I could move forward from like listening to the anxiety to like learning from it okay what is it that just happened that made me even go down this spiral like am I grieving um and that's what I discovered in my therapy sessions was as much as I started the grieving process I went from the grieving process to focusing on music and making music and kind of, and I use that as an instrument to drown out right. my grieving process. So you still didn't. And I had not really mm-hmm. allowed that process to take place. And I hadn't given into it because I was like, I'm making music. I'm happy. I don't want to be sad. I don't want to think about it. But, you know, in my mind, in my brain, my brain was like, I want to explore these things. <laughs> So you don't get to sleep. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> because huh. I want to go through this and I want to explore these things. And so I had to take the time and do the work to actually learn like, okay, what is triggering this mm-hmm. and what is helping? And then how can I, I'm, you know, regular anxiety. Yes, you can kind of get rid of that. But when you have a chemical imbalance in your brain, yeah. outside of like medical medicine, it's hard to get rid of that. So it is something that I live with, but now I'm able to limit it because again, I can confront it with the truth. Um, I can confront it with gratitude. Um, mm-hmm. I have another song on my EP called 100,000 Heartbeats, like literally talking about just the very basic things that happen in our daily lives, like our 100,000 heartbeats and our 20,000 breaths that we take every day. Like every single one of those things is a miracle. Yeah. And if we, you know, take our focus off of like such big picture things and really drill down to like the little miracles that happen each and every day, like that kind of gets your mind back focused off of it state keeps you in the present instead of being focused on the future, which is where yeah. anxiety comes from. <laughs> like yes. trying to figure out and predict and it, what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> it takes bravery too, because you have to confront those big, scary emotions and ask them, you know, why are you here? What are you trying mm-hmm. to teach me? Or, you know, what, what is happening that I'm feeling these emotions, even forget lessons, just like what, what just triggered me? What is going on? Why am I feeling this way? I'm a big emotional eater and I have only just recently sort of started doing the same thing. Like when I feel the urge where I'm just like, you know, I really want ice cream right now, you know, my emotional support ice cream, <laughs> like, wait, why just stopping? Cause you know, there's just the, well, you shouldn't do that because it's, it's not healthy, but that doesn't really get to the core of why I am craving ice, ice cream or potato chips or whatever it is, you know, it's never the healthy food that you, that you eat when you're <laughs> emotional. Craves broccoli. Nobody, yeah. nobody's no. like, Oh, I really want some broccoli. Like, no, <laughs> no. but then just stopping and being like, what am I feeling right now? Why do I want to soothe myself with food? Mm-hmm. And then you're like, Oh, I'm feeling sad or angry or, you know, whatever. Well, why am I feeling that emotion? And then I can sometimes figure out what happened in my day that has has me feeling that way and it's sort of going doing that work and asking the questions to figure it all out and then by the end then I can say okay yes I still want the ice cream because ice cream is delicious or no I don't really need it right now because I know that I have these feelings that I need to work through first and the ice cream is really not going to help me process these emotions yeah so (laughs) i too am an emotional eater (laughs) (laughs) totally relate to that like why do i want chocolate so badly right now (laughs) because chocolate is going to give me a hormonal boost that is going to mask what i'm feeling right now and i don't feel Mm -hmm. like feeling my feelings so i'd rather have chocolate than feel my feelings (laughs) exactly exactly we'd rather have that sugar high that will (laughs) mask everything that's exactly what we're looking for but yeah doing the work to understand the feelings and and just reassuring ourselves that it's not just us we're not alone in this situation And finding those things that then bring us joy to help bring us back to ourselves. Yes, that's so, um, it's so important. And I can say like, as a, as a single childless person, I had to find me Mm -hmm. and the things that brought me joy. Um, a lot of times I was getting joy out of bringing joy to other people and I wasn't really focusing on what was truly making me happy. It was like, it was dependent on other people. Um, and that was making me sad because if I didn't have anybody to make joyful in a moment where I needed to get out of that, 
And I'm not like downplaying that. Like that is, it's a great tool. Like when you're going through some sort of um, emotional or mental health um, crisis issue to get out there and like help other people. I'm not saying that people shouldn't do that. No, that's definitely a great mechanism. Dependent on that. Mm -hmm. Um, I really had to get real with myself and say, okay, the reality of your life is you live with your cat and, and most of the day is just going to be you. So how are you going to be happy with you? How are you? And I don't even like necessarily using the word happy because I feel like happy depends on things happening, but like, <laughs> mm-hmm. how, how are, are you going to feel be, fulfilled? How are you going to be fulfilled with you? Uh, fulfilled is actually, that's like my word of the year is fulfilled. So that's so awesome that you just said that. <laughs> like <laughs> that's my word. Like because that is that is truly what I've been seeking. What are things that actually leave me feeling fulfilled, genuinely? Me, without anybody else being involved, what is leaving me feeling fulfilled? And not feeling like something is missing or that I have to figure something out that's Mm -hmm. not in this moment, that's in the future, that's down the line, you know? And so that has been a big part of my journey recently is once I figured out who I am, which was a whole other process and (laughs) just like my identity and who I am, like, okay, now what is it that actually makes me be, be and feel fulfilled? Because a lot of things that I did in my life I've accomplished many things that I'm grateful for, but a lot of times I was doing them because it would make other people happy Mm -hmm. or it would make other people be impressed with me or it would make other people respect me. And it wasn't actually something that I actually wanted to do. Right. Yeah. I think a lot of us find ourselves ourselves in that position where we're, we're living life for other people and trying to make other people happy instead of figuring out what what we really want, what our soul is here to do, mm-hmm. um, what our our purpose is and how to do that while still also making those around us pleasant and feel good. Right. Um but but leading um from our from ourselves first. So if you had one word of advice for people who are really deep in the darkness, what would you tell them? For anyone who's really deep in the darkness, I would tell them to not be afraid to be in that darkness. Um, When we're deep in the darkness, so often we are trying so hard to get out to the light and the thing that I had to learn was to sit in the darkness and to figure out how I got there wow and a lot of times when we're chasing the light we don't take the time to figure out how we got in the dark place if you don't know how you got there you will end up back there. And so wow. you really have to sit and notice how you ended up there and stop being afraid of the dark because there's lessons to be learned in the dark that you can carry into the light with you. Wow, that's really, really powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Um, and sharing your story and your inspiration and your humor and your wisdom. I appreciate you. And we will have links for people to hear your music and read your books in the description of the podcast. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening. Remember that you are loved 
You are worthy. You are valuable. You are meant for more and that it really does get better. If you are in crisis, there are numbers that you can call or text to get the help that you need. That information for Canada and the U.S. is in the description below each episode. If you are in immediate crisis, please call 911. We love you, and I hope you'll listen again.